spent a lot of time praying for each other, but hopefully it was, it was encouraging. Okay, so before we begin, I'd like to go ahead and just share a little bit about what to expect over the next five weeks. So this, this first week, it, we're, we're going to be talking about our core identities of Monument Hill Church, and this, this first week we're going to be talking about truth. You can see the core identities up there, right? So truth will be this week, missions on August 6th, together on August 13th, and worship on August 20th. And then the fifth week, August 27th, we're going to all still gather together, I think still in this room. It might, it might be a different room though, but gather together for breakfast um, prior to the worship service. So it might actually be out there just so that, I don't know where it's going to be, but that's the plan is there's going to be a breakfast. And then the, ver the very following week, we'll start back up with that growth group model that I talked about. So that's kind of where we're going. Um, and then what I, Wanted to kind of just, well, let's just start. So, so the, the easiest question of the day, what are the four core identities? <laughs> All right. And what is a core identity to you? Foundation. Okay. Any other thoughts? Christ. Christ. Yeah, so I like that, what you base your decisions off of. Any other thoughts? What's that? What we all have in common. Yeah, I like that too. How you order your life. So I thought by starting with the, uh, the vision and the mission statement of Monument Hill Church, I want to read both those to you. So the vision is to grow as a healthy biblical church for the glory of God and the joy of all people by treasuring Jesus Christ above all together. And the mission is to glorify God by enjoying him forever as we follow Jesus as his disciples. And so how do we grow as a healthy biblical church? How do we treasure Jesus above all? How do we give glory to God? All those things, we, we do them by living out what we call these core identities, both when we're together here, but must, much more importantly, when you're at home, at work, you know, away from this building. And the, the core identities, they are characteristics that we seek to live out in all we do as a church body. And so when somebody asks you, like, well, what is Monument Hill Church all about? These core identities should come to mind. Of how, this is how we live out that that vision and that mission for the church. So if somebody, I guess I should do it because I have a microphone. I'll read <laughs> Acts 2, 42 through 47. So one second, let me turn there. All right, so, so where do we get these core identities from? Acts 2, 42 through 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. In there, in that section is missions, is truth, is the teaching, is the, the Lord's adding to the church. Um, it's together right? and uh, worship for sure, are all kind of within that passage. And so that's kind of the, the focal passage where we get the core identities that we use to live out. Well, what, is, what makes us kind of unique as a church? Uh, as for preparing this this morning, 
I used the, the Bible, ESV Study Bible, and then these three resources are the prim, primary ones. This is a recommendation from Pastor Caleb. It's the Inspiration and Authority of the Bible, and a very good you know, book on, on the kind of like the definitive reference of how do I know this is God's word. Uh, this is a recommendation from Akeem. It is Reformed Systematic Theology. Uh, this is book one of four. So if you, it's kind of nice if you really want to go deep in systematic theology. It has a lot more content than the one that I tend to use more commonly, which is Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. So it's when you go like, where did you get some of these ideas and things? This is uh, heavily leveraged out of you know, these books. So you know the sources, and if you have any interest in checking them out. Okay. Into to like 20 minutes? Yeah. Well, I'm only taking little slices, right? So <laughs> there's a lot more. Like this first one, Reform Systematic Theology, this is just focusing on revelation and God. And then the this second book is like Jesus and the Spirit, and you know, they're they're great. And if any question you have, you can kind of like just dive in and get a lot of good content on it. Okay. So we are we're a church committed to living out these four core identities, and today we're discussing the core identity of truth. We're, and the, the definition that we use for how that works is we are a church that is committed to preaching, teaching, and living the eternal truths found in God's word in our daily lives and corporately when we gather together. So today we're going to unpack that statement. We're, we're gonna, we are a church that does not shy away from all of scripture, right? We, know, we consider that all of scripture is God-breathed and we do not skip over hard parts or not discuss difficult concepts. We are committed to the truth. We're committed to preaching, teaching, and living the eternal truths that are found in God's word. So who's seen the Truth Project? Okay, quite a few people. If, if you're not familiar with it, it's a DVD series. It was released in 2007. It's like 13 one-hour lessons by Dr. Dell Tackett. And he talks about a biblical worldview. And he goes through each area of sphere of kind of history, philosophy, you know, human thought, all these things. And, and, and how, do, how do we have a biblical worldview in that area? And you know, through, all through this thing that he called like a compass that he would have you go through. Um, one of the things that I ran into and in looking into this is there's a Barna, I believe it is, let me check, make sure I got that right, Barna Research Group in 2020 found that only 9% of born-again believers actually hold a biblical worldview, which is pretty wild, 9%. And one of Del Tackett's questions that he continually asked throughout the series is, do you really believe that what you believe is really real? And that, I first watched it shortly after it came out, and that question, it kind of like sticks with you. Do you really believe that what you believe is really real? And if so, then how, how are we supposed to live? And I think if we really believe that what we believe is really real, we're going to look like what is described in Colossians 3, 1 through 2. If you've then been raised with Christ, we seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated, seated at the right hand of God. And set your minds on things that are above not on the things of earth. And so I love how Dell, for those of you who've seen it, you're gonna have a big leg up here, but Dell, he asked this question in the beginning, and I think it's fantastic, it's fantastic. Why did Jesus come to the world? I'm asking you guys. To save the world. So absolutely, and what an amazing thing, right? Implies also that we need saving. Teach, to teach us, yeah, teach the way of the Father. That's getting more in line with the specific answer I'm looking for. Any others? Say it again. Reconcile us. Yeah, amen and praise God because we couldn't do it. There you go. Declare the truth. So I'm going to read from the John chapter 18, verses 33 through 37. And this is Jesus before Pilate. And says, so Pilate entered his headquarters again and called and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And I'll say that's John chapter 18, verse 33, if you guys want to turn there. So are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to you about me? And Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you over to me. 
What, did, what have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king? And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. And here he tells us, for this purpose I was born. And for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Other translations say to testify to the truth. And if you look at the very next verse, what is Pilate's response? What is truth? Does that sound like today? What is truth? All right, the dictionary definition, you're going to get that. Being in accordance with the actual state or conditions, conforming to reality or fact, not false, real, genuine, authentic. What does our culture say? Truth is relative. What was the other one? Whatever you feel. So feelings. Yeah, that's huge. So objective meaning, objective truth, it's been lost in our contemporary culture. Sounds like it was lost a little bit during Pilate's time too. We we hear people talking about their truth or my Jesus or my God instead of the truth as if there could be such a thing. The Bible has declared, or so the, a, a postmodern view of reading the Bible has declared you can't know what any text means, that it's up to the reader of that text to establish the meaning. And our culture is becoming increasingly nihilistic, which is a, a view that holds that nothing can really be known about morality, about knowledge, about human values, life is meaningless, all religion is a farce. And how has the modern church embraced this crisis of truth? Nor the Bible, or at least sections of it, right? And so I've got a, a little quote here from Al, Al Mohler. He said, many have openly celebrated the rise of the postmodern age, redefining themselves as revisionists, reformists, post-conservatives, or even post-evangelicals. Philip D. Kennison welcomed this postmodern worldview with the title of his book, There's No Such Thing as Objective Truth, and It's a Good Thing Too. Kennison said of postmodernism, We need to embrace this and move beyond what he calls the truth question. The sooner we do, he says, the sooner we can get on with being Christian, which in no way entails accepting a certain philosophical account of truth, justification, and reality. Like, it, that's crazy. The sooner we get, get on with it, the sooner we can get on with being Christian. So let me ask you this. Can, can something be objectively true and not true at the same time? Yeah, objective there, meaning it's not influenced by personal feelings or opinions when you consider the facts. So I submit, and I've got a lot of notes, that objective truth does exist. There are certain things that are true, independent of the perceptions, the feelings, the knowledge of people. There's objective truth. It's always true for all people under all conditions. And this is also key, whether or not they believe it. So as a concrete example, like this book is either the, the word of God and the ultimate authority for every person of every age, for everyone in this room, or it's not. It can't be, it is for Tanya, right? But not for Guy, and somehow both simultaneously true, right? So it's, it's God is revealed in the Bible. He either created everything. He's the sustainer of everything. He's our redeemer, or he's not. He's made up by men. Everybody follow me there? Like it has to be one or the other. They can't both be true at the same time. That objective truth, we can contrast that with subjective truth, which relates to our feelings about the world. And in this case, like I can say mushrooms are absolutely delicious. There you go. And others, you can be like, mushrooms are disgusting. And we can both be right, right? That's, there's no contradiction there. But if I say there's mushrooms on that pizza, that statement is either true or false. The pizza either has mushrooms or it doesn't have mushrooms It doesn't matter how you feel about the mushrooms. So many churches today, they take the word of God and they treat at least sections of it as subjective truth. They take what has been you know, right interpretation for thousands of years and they skip over it or change it and thereby nullify the precious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And, and it's my prayer here that that never happens at Monument Hill Church. And I think that we as a congregation too need to be in prayer for leadership, not just pastors and, and elders, but you know, the, the deacons, the people who are serving on Sundays, our volunteers, our growth group leader teachers, like be praying that we will not be conformed to the world and that we will stay rooted and anchored in God's word. So we're a church that's committed to preaching and teaching and living the eternal truths found in God's word. Where do we find the truth? In God's word. So most of you are probably going to be like, yeah, it's in, it's in this book. It's God's word. Some of you in here might be saying, well, how do I know it's God's word? And I'm very glad you asked. So let me start. I'll start with reading a little bit that was from this book, Inspiration and Authority of the Bible. The religion of the Bible is frankly a supernatural religion. By this is not meant that merely according to it, all men as creatures live, move, and have their being in God. It's meant that according to it, God has intervened extraordinarily in the course of the sinful world's development for the salvation of men otherwise lost. In Eden, the Lord God had been present with sinless man. This intimate association was broken up by the fall, but God did not therefore withdraw himself from concernment with men. Rather, he began at once a series of interventions in human history by which man might be rescued from his sin. And these interventions, they involved a segregation of a people for himself by whom God should be known. And then God does make himself known to Israel and he intervenes and he reveals truth to them. And this revelation is recorded in the Bible. And thus the religion of the Bible, it's distinctly and uniquely from God and not from man. So from creation to redemption, God's supernatural revelation of himself played a central role in his relationship to mankind. God reveals himself to man and God communicates truths about himself that there's no way we would ever be able to know them on our own. It had to come from his revelation. And he does it interestingly, in ways that we can understand and relate to. Um, so we read in 1 Thessalonians 2, 2, 13. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it really is the word of God, which is an amazing statement. This is Paul, Silvanius, and Timothy. They're talking to the early church in Thessalonica, and they're saying, the words that we are saying are not our words, they're the very words of God. And in Galatians 1, 11, and 12, Paul says, for I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation from Jesus Christ. And so we know from verses like that, there's verses, uh, 2 Peter in chapter three, where Peter says that Paul's writings are scripture. And, and 1 Timothy 5, 18, Paul quotes Luke's writing of scripture, um, Jude 17 and 18, Jude quotes Peter, or maybe Peter was quoting Jude, depending on how who you think which one was written first. But the Bible writers, they were very aware that what they were writing was the word of God. And the, the ESV study Bible, it states it this way. It says, basic to the Bible's canonical status as its inspiration, this word indicates divinely affected uniqueness comparable to the uniqueness of the person of the incarnate Lord. So if you listen to this next sentence, I think this is real key. As Jesus Christ was totally human and totally divine, so is the Bible. All scripture is a witness to God given by divinely illuminated human writers. And all scripture is God witnessing to himself in and through their words. The way into the mind of God is through the expressed mind of these human writers. And in this way, God tells the reader the truth about himself, his work pre past, present, and future, and his will for people's lives. The Bible, it's made up, it's 66 books written by 40, 40 human authors over a period of 1,500 years. It's in two distinct sections. If I state it very simply, it's the Old Testament, which predicts what, what will happen, and the New Testament, which records that it happens. The Bible says things will happen, and things happen. And so how can we know that this is the Word of God? Well, first, as we already alluded to, the Bible claims that these are the very words of God. So the Old Testament is full of the phrase, thus says the Lord, over 800 times, actually. This would carry for readers a similar feel of the command, thus says the king, when a king would make an edict of his subjects. Hundreds of times we read, thus says the Lord. And we further have God speaking through his prophets and then recording those prophecies. So I have four verses here I'll read for you. Second Peter 121. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God 
as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Zechariah 7.7. 7. Were these not the words that the Lord proclaimed by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and prosperous? Joshua 3.9. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, come here and listen to the words of the Lord, your God. In Isaiah 38, God commands Isaiah, and now go, write it before them on a tablet and inscribe it in a book that it might be for the time to come a witness forever. So we have huge chunks of the Old Testament scripture where God's words are spoken directly, where he says, God says this, spoken through prophets, spoken as they're led through the Holy Spirit. And then interestingly, we get in the New Testament and Jesus refers to all of the Old Testament as God's word, not just the thus says the Lord parts. So in Matthew 4.4, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 8.3 when he's tempted by Satan. He says, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And Jesus further stated in Matthew 5.17 that he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. So Jesus spoke of the Old Testament in terms of actual history, events that were recorded that truly occurred. And Jesus also testified that the scriptures were a united, complete unfolding story. So in Luke 24, 44, then he said to him, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms, which is what the Old Testament was referred to by the Jews, must be fulfilled. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted in them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So someone might be saying, okay, that's all well and good, but you're using circular reasoning. You're saying we believe the Bible is the word of God because it declares itself to be the word of God. And therefore we believe it's the word of God. Does that make sense? So if the Bible is the word of God, and it's a, it's a fair criticism, if the Bible is the word of God and that is an objective truth, meaning it is true whether or not we believe it, then it follows that we would have to appeal to the Bible to assert this truth. Then theologians, they state that the words of scripture are self-attesting meaning that we cannot appeal to any higher authority to prove that they are God's words. And if you think about that some, that makes sense. Like I, what I'm saying is I cannot use history or archaeology or logic or reason to state that the Bible is the word of God authoritatively, because if I did, then I would be saying that history or logic or archaeology or reason are above scripture. Does that make sense? So as an example, right? I believe the Bible is the word of God because it's reasonable to me to do so. Then what am I putting as my ultimate authority? My reason, yeah. And same with any of those other categories. So so that's point one. The Bible declares itself to be the, the, the word of God. Point two is that we're convinced of the truthfulness of its claims to be God's word as we read the Bible. So this realization occurs when the Holy Spirit speaks to us through the words of the Bible. The Holy Spirit reveals the truthfulness of scripture and lets us know that these are the very words our creator has spoken for us. And this has happened for millions of believers for thousands of years. My wife, Sarah, can attest to this, that she just was spending time in God's word and kept growing in a love for it, right? As she encountered the living God through it. And I don't know if any of you tried reading the Bible as a non-believer, but it, like I did, it doesn't make sense. And it didn't have the same kind of impact. And then you read in 2 Corinthians 2, 13 and 14, as we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God for they are folly to him. And he's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. In John 10, 27, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And this is, I think this concept of like, we read it and we know it's God's word is most clearly stated by the Westminster Confession of Faith. I'm gonna read paragraph five. It's a little bit confusing language. So try to follow along, but I think it's, it's well stated still. We may be influenced by the testimony of the church to value the Bible highly and rever- reverently. And scripture itself shows in so many ways that it's God's word. For example, in its spiritual subject matter, in the effectiveness of its teaching, in the majesty of its style, the agreement of all its parts, its unified aim from beginning to end to give all glory to God, the further revelation it makes of the only way of man's salvation, its many other incomparably outstanding features and its complete perfection. However, we are completely persuaded and assured of the infallible truth and divine authority of the Bible only by the inward working of the Holy Spirit who testifies by and with the word in our hearts. 
So we read scripture and we hear our creator's voice and it's entirely different from any other book. And then a third reason that we believe the Bible is the word of God is all that other stuff that I mentioned before, archaeology, logic, reason. Uh, just like the Westminster Confession of Faith said, it's consistent, it's unified, it's perfect. Unlike any other religious text, it's continually affirm, affirmed to be historically correct and accurate and dependable. And these are great things. They give me confidence too. We can study it, ponder it, go as deep as you can in it and not worry about finding errors. You may find difficult things and that's one of the joys as a Christian to be able to wrestle through those. Uh, but being God's word, it's entirely true. So we read in 2 Timothy, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. All scripture is breathed out by God. So we are a church committed to the preaching, teaching, living the eternal truths found in God's word in our daily lives and corporately when we gather together. And this is truth, all of it. And so we're committed to preaching all of it, like I said in the beginning, without shying away from difficult portions. We're committed to teaching as accurately as we can with the help of the Holy Spirit and putting great effort and care into how we handle God's word. And then there's the application. We live the truth found in God's word in our daily lives. So preaching, teaching, Interpretation of the Bible without application, it's simply just dead Bible study. And I'm sure you've met some folks like this, but I know some just really grumpy Christians that have amazing head knowledge of the Bible. Um, and it's sad to see. You know, I've seen people too that would be like, well, I can't find a church good enough. I'm just going to stop going to church. And it's sad to see. Uh, the, the, the truths that we read here need to have deep transformational change in our lives and how we actually act. And so with that said, I know I've been talking for a while, what are some concrete ways that this living out could look like in our, our lives? Loving people, absolutely. Loving your neighbor as yourself is incredibly challenging, depending on your neighbor. <laughs> Any others that you can think of? Encouraging each other. Encouraging each other. Amen. Bearing one another's burdens. Holding each other accountable. Yep. Can't have one without the other, right? Encouragement without exhortation of the truth. How about knowing what's in the book? Yeah, Don. Overcoming sin. Yeah, so it'd be us. Uh, do not the do not be conformed. It's Second Thess or First Thessalonians five, where it's like you do not conform your, or behave in the same way. I butchered that. You can look it up. First Thessalonians five. <laughs> where you place your hope, right? So that also, I think you could think of it in a, in a way that, that ties in with humility, where not that I think less of myself, but I just know I'm nothing without the Lord, and that I need to humble myself before him and submit to him. And that is where my hope is. That's where provision comes from. As much as we try to control things, we're not in control. You know, so yeah. Also, mm -hmm. For a future hope, which should bring joy. Conviction of sin. Say that again. Conviction of sin. Conviction of sin. Yes, yeah. As you know God's word, you read God's word. If you read it and there is no concern that you have, I think then we're maybe not reading it rightly. You know, there should be conviction as we're going through. They we're all, all growing. Not, nobody has arrived. Amen. Yes. Yeah, sharing for sure. All your heart. Awesome. I think that here's one I'll, I'll, I'll maybe pick on closer to home too, is to, we want to seek the Lord's will in our life. And, and that also means like how we, because we're talking about core identities, how we operate together as a congregation. What's the Lord's will for you here too, as far as serving? I know so, some people serve a lot. There's some people that are, you might be on the fence. You might be like, I don't know how to. I, I pray, you know, ask the Lord to really, how can you use the unique way that you're wired to, to live out truth with this body of believers? 
thoughts? All right, and I think uh, ultimately to see this all lived out proper, proper, properly, we look to our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, go ahead. Well, the other thing from, from our model, that's the, the truth is the foundation, the how you live it out is the mission and worship and together. So that's one of the things. Yeah, great the point. Details the details of those three are more of the living out the truth, all right? Awesome. So yeah, so look into the Lord Jesus Christ. He perfectly lived out the word. And in fact, in the gospel of John chapter one, we read that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and all things were made through him. So I think we look to Jesus. He's the author, perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is now seated at the right hand of the father. And Jesus who made creation, he's greater than creation. He's greater than the temple. He's greater than the Sabbath. He's greater than the church. He's greater than any name. And we I think we look to Jesus to know the truth. So in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. As the word of God, Jesus is the fullest possible revelation from God to man. So God could not have spoken any, the truth any more plainly than he did through his son, Jesus, our Lord. So I'm done way early. That's all I have for thoughts, but I feel, is there any parts you guys want to discuss or talk a little bit more about? Oh, like the message. So certain, the translations that are not word for word or thought for thought, but they're like more of like a concept or a theme. I, I wouldn't, I'd use them carefully myself. I think that there are times when it might be helpful to go look at, well, what does somebody think that this section means in plain English? I, I, I wouldn't for sure treat it the same as I would treat a, a very careful translation. So like we use the ESV here. ESV is a word for word translation, except for the cases when you do a word for word translation and it creates the wrong outcome. So in cases where you might read that and you're like, okay, I'm gonna get the wrong idea from this passage, then they'll change it to be a, a okay, well, what was the thought of that idea there? And sometimes have footnotes about that too. But it's it's, one that I appreciate because as much as possible, it is a clear representation of the Hebrew scriptures, you know, the New Testament, as it was originally written, as best we can get back to the original manuscripts. And uh, it just changes it when it would be confusing. So it, does, it can be a little bit, maybe more challenging to read sometimes though, than like an NIV, which will make sure that it's written in clear modern English. I think they're targeting like a seventh grade reading level or something like that. It's and don't quote me if I'm wrong on that, but it's definitely, it's, it's made to be easier to read. Anybody else have thoughts on that, like the message or some of the others are out there? Oh, his question is, what, what, what do we think about uh, Bible translations that are, that are like the message, that are, are distilling it into modern kind of thought and story? Anything else? All right, well, let me pray for us. We'll be done and can hang out a little early. Okay. Thank you, Lord, for your word of truth. It's a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our paths. And I just, I ask you, Lord, to illuminate those paths clearly for us that we may effectively labor together as a congregation to build up a healthy church for your glory. You had no need within yourself to reveal yourself to, to us, but you did, Lord, and we're so thankful. We're grateful. We're grateful in this room that you grafted us into your people. What a joy it is, Lord, to be a part of your family. And along with that joy, I just ask you to put a deep burden on everyone's heart to know you more, to love you more, to glorify you more, and that you would empower us to do so in our daily lives. Help us, Lord, to be rooted and grounded in your truth. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Go. Cool.